All right. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we get started? Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming out this evening. Uh, we're really excited uh, to be hosting Edge Talks, which is in a, uh, every four to six months we'll have an event. Our last one was focused on robotic process automation. Now we're focused on uh, blockchain. Uh, we have a great panel of speakers. Uh, our keynote uh, will be addressed by Don Tapscott. And so we think that this should be a really good event and great night, followed by some networking afterwards where everyone can mingle. Everyone here is obviously very interested in the blockchain topic, so it's a great way to bring uh, like-minded people together so we can learn together and we can meet others who have like-minded uh, like interests. Um, very quick background about the Bernie Group. Uh, so I founded the Bernie Group approximately seven years ago. It would be seven years in February. Um, and the idea that I had was, having been at McKinsey for about eight years, I said, you know, there's a better way to do this. When we do our consulting projects, we come up with great recommendations, but too frequently our clients have challenges in implementing those implementations. What if we helped by bringing great technology to the table? And so over the past seven years, what we've been doing at the Burning Group is really thinking through how do we bring those best practices of management consulting and pair them with technology? So whether that's workforce management or robotic process automation, or in this case, blockchain, our goal and our ideal is to work with our clients to help them both from a strategic perspective, figure out what should they be doing, and then from an executional perspective, how do we actually do it? And so we've been on that journey for seven years. It's been really exciting. And we see blockchain as one of those opportunities that's going to truly transform the way that we work. So we've been very much focused on this. Um, Doug Heinzman uh, is the head of our blockchain practice, who you'll meet in a second. And we're thrilled that he came. He was leading strategy at IBM down in New York. And I said, uh, he and I met together and we said, you know, the transformation the blockchain will bring, we have to figure out a way to help others really embrace the blockchain technology. So that's a little bit about uh, the Bernie Group and uh, blockchain and why we're here. Uh, the plan for this evening, uh, Doug will shortly do a quick introduction to our keynote speaker, Don Tapscott. Um, then we'll have a really exciting uh, panel of speakers from both industry and uh, academics come up. And uh, after that, it'll be an opportunity for you. Uh, you can have a drink and speak one-on-one -on -one with our speakers or speak to each other through uh, a, bit, a bit of networking after. So that's, uh, that's the evening uh, and the course of events. So I hope you all enjoy it. And thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Dave said, my name is uh, Doug Heinzman, and I lead the blockchain practice at the Bernie Group. And I'm very excited uh, to uh, be with all of you this evening, as well as uh, I'm very pleased to be able to present a, a really fascinating panel of speakers to talk about uh, a really exciting and very important topic. I'm not going to kind of get into it right now, because that's what the next hour and a half is all about. But uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, tonight the uh, keynote speaker, um, Don Tapscott. Uh, Don is the CEO of the Tapscott Group, and he's also the executive chairman of the Blockchain Research Institute. He's one of the world's leading authorities on the impact of technology on business and society. He's authored 15, over 15 books, including Wikonomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything, and is the co-author of Blockchain Revolution. Uh, the Blockchain Research Institute has 70 plus projects investigating blockchain strategy, use cases, implementation challenges, and organizational transformations. Don is a member of the Order of Canada, and he's ranked as the second most influential management thinker in the world by Thinkers 50, which must drive, drive him crazy because so close. Um, He's an adjunct professor at the Rotman School of Management, and he's the chancellor of the Trent University in, in, uh, in, well, here in Ontario. 
Uh, Dawn has helped countless companies over the world, around the world uh, understand technological revolutions and their impact on business and society. One of those companies happens to have been um, IBM, which is uh, where I actually first met Dawn about uh, 10 or so years ago. Um, IBM had engaged him at the time to help um, the company think through the impact of social networks and the potential of the commons. And uh, I can tell you very first, uh, from a first-hand perspective, that uh, his insights uh, were the cause of uh, quite a bit of conversation and deep thinking over a very long period of time, and he was quite influential in shaping the thinking um, that uh, we implemented at IBM. So without further ado, I am extremely pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Don Tapscott to the stage. Well, uh, thank you uh, for that too kind introduction. Yeah, number two. It's like, we're number two. <laughs> for the previous um, six years, I was number four, which was really bad, because like he didn't even make the podium, you know. <laughs> anyway, I, I am happy to be here. And um, thanks to the Bernie Group uh, for inviting me, and thanks for giving each of you a copy of Blockchain Revolution, because the best way to buy this book is in massive volume. And uh, the Bernie Group is showing great wisdom and leadership by buying in volume, because this is the way, no. Um, <clears throat> we're um, we're uh, very proud of that book, and it's still the best selling book in the world about blockchain. I'm off to Korea tomorrow morning. It's in, uh, and then China, it's, uh, a bestseller in five Asian languages. And um, this whole blockchain thing is finally taking off. Who, uh, would you put up your hand, please? You're in one of four categories. Category number one, what's a blockchain? Category number two, I know a little bit. I couldn't really explain it properly. Uh, number three, I'm quite knowledgeable. Number four, this is my world, OK? Number one, what's a blockchain? Number two, I know a little bit, couldn't really explain it much, okay. Number three, I'm, I'm pretty, no, no, number four, it's my world, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm looking around, who are these people? I need to know them. Um, I will give you one million dollars to come and work <laughs> with us. <clears throat> as, <laughs> as an aside, it's kind of a funny issue, you know that you're, you're hiring these young people and they've been right out of university and they've been investing in crypto for five years. Um, it's sort of an interesting challenge. Let me ask another qu question. Who here owns some crypto? Hands? Who here has a actual wallet, their own wallet? Okay, pretty much the same. Okay. Who wishes that they would bought Bitcoin a year ago when <laughs> Uh, Alex Tapscott, my um, son and co-author, and I wrote a prediction in uh, December of last year, uh, so 13 months ago, uh, about the top 10 things that were going to happen. And one of them, Bitcoin was trading at $700. We said, Bitcoin will go to $2,000. Then we said, that's right. A single Bitcoin will be worth at least $2,000. And we were like trashed on Twitter. You guys are nuts. We were nuts. <laughs> anyway, let's uh, get into it. The topic tonight is making this real. And the uh, first thing I'm going to try and do is convince you that this is not about Bitcoin. It's not even about crypto assets. It's about something much bigger. You see, we have this fourth industrial revolution that's underway. Uh, the first was steam, and we mechanized things like hose and shovels and looms. The second was electricity. And the big impact on the economy was through the industrial production line, mass production. The third was the computer, mainframes, minis, PCs, uh, the internet, the web, social media, the mobile web, the social web, the cloud, big data. And the fourth is technology is infusing itself into everything, into our world with trillions of inert objects become smart communicating devices, uh, devices soon doing transactions, enhancing their reputation. Uh, through machine learning and AI, where technology does 
stuff that it wasn't programmed to do because it's able to reprogram itself and learn and so on, technology in our bodies. And to us, the most important of all of these are the foundational, insofar as these will play in the firm, in our institutions, and in the economy, is the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies, blockchain. Blockchain, not the most sonorous word in the world. Um, I'm off to Davos in a couple of weeks, and I've been asked to speak in the famous piano bar. So I figured while I'm in the bar, I might as well write the blockchain blues. So I've been working on that uh, today, but anyway. Um, I'm convinced that this is nothing less than the second era of the internet. So let me explain that. Uh, I started, actually, I'm dating myself, in the late 70s at Bell Northern Research, and we argued that Computers were going to be used by everyone, and they would become a tool for communications. And we were right, but a little detail about that is when I send you some information, PDF, a PowerPoint, an email, I'm actually not sending you the information. I'm sending you a copy. Even with a website, I keep the original. And that works fine for information. We've all had a printing press at our fingertips. It's democratized information. But when it comes to assets, the things that really matter to the economy in Canada or that matter to a company, things like money or uh, stocks or bonds or things like, um, like loyalty points or intellectual property or uh, cultural assets, things of uh, value that belong to somebody, art, music, votes, um, energy, carbon credits, even our identities. Sending a copy of those is a terrible idea. You don't want someone copying your identity or your vote. And if I send you $1,000, it's really important that I don't still have the money, right? And that I can't send it to you and to you and to you. Now, cryptographers have called this a double spend problem for a long time. And the way that we manage this problem in our economy is through intermediaries. Banks, governments, credit card companies, now social media companies, others, lawyers. And these intermediaries provide all of the business and transaction logic of every type of commerce. They identify the party. You are who you are. They identify the asset. This is a valid you know, stock or vote. They clear and settle transactions. They count things up. They keep records. And overall, they've done a pretty good job, especially in Canada. Um, we've had good government. We've had good banks overall. But there are growing problems. Uh, some of you attended CIBO. So it was in Toronto. It's the biggest meeting of bankers in the world. It was here in Toronto in the fall. And nine years ago, CIBO's 2008, the final keynote uh, was given by me. And it was in Vienna. Now, the interesting thing about this story is this occurred two days after Lehman Brothers fell. And so I looked out at this sea of 10,000 bankers, sort of like deer in the headlights. And I did throw away my PowerPoint, which, you know, power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. That was probably a good thing to do. But, and I gave my sort of uninformed talk about what I thought was wrong with the financial system. Well, we've learned a lot since then. You know, it's not just bad behavior like Wall Street. I'm, the core modus operandi of Wall Street almost brought down the global capitalist system. We were days, some people say, uh, hours from the ATMs running out of money. But these big intermediaries need help. They're based on traditional server technology, and they're centralized. It means that they can be hacked, because any central systems can be. They, um, they slow things down too much, given how fast the digital age has sped up other things. It takes a second for an email to go around the world. It can take days or even weeks for digital assets and computer systems to move up Wall Street. They charge too much these days, given the way that things work. You know, it. it <laughs> The, the Filipino diaspora in Toronto sending money back to their family 
um, in their ancestral land can be charged 10 to 20 percent just to move money from one place to another. Anyone ever heard of cross-border email payments? Isn't it sort of the same? How can it, why can it, why is it so much money? Um, in many parts of the world, they exclude a couple of billion people from the global economy. Now, in fairness to the banks, it's not just that those pe these people don't have enough money to have a profitable bank account. Most of them don't even have an identity. And the biggest problem to me, and this is hard for me to admit this, because I've been a big cheerleader for the digital age for a long time, but today, the net effect of all this digital on our economy is that we have growing wealth but declining prosperity. Our economies are growing, but in most OECD countries, the middle class is shrinking. We have a bipolarization of wealth. How can this be? And that's what's behind Donald Trump and Brexit and, and all the populism and other stuff in the world today. I'm not saying intermediaries are going to go away. They won't. Or even they should go away. I'm saying they need a lot of help. What if? What if there were not just an internet of information? What if there were an internet of value? Some kind of vast, global, distributed ledger where anything of value from money to stocks, to votes, to music could be managed, transacted, score, uh, stored in a secure and private way. What if there were a native digital medium for value, like there is for information? Well, that's the way that Bitcoin becomes part of this story. Because it was in 2008, this anonymous person or persons named Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a paper and Satoshi cracked the double spend problem. And any programmer or technical person I know who's read that paper said the top of their head practically blows off. Because Satoshi found a way whereby people could transact peer to peer. And trust was not achieved by an intermediary, but by cryptography, by collaboration, and by some clever code. Uh, which is why uh, my son Alex and I call it the trust protocol. Trust is native to the medium. Now, don't be confused by Bitcoin, okay? And this is one of my jobs up here before we get to the panel, is to make sure we're all clear about that. Bitcoin is a bunch of things. It's an asset class, and sure, you all wish you'd bought, well, many of you do, wish you'd bought lots of it. Um, it's a store of value, and that's of interest, Maybe, especially if you're in an unstable economy or something like that, or, or there, are, there are limitations over the flow of uh, funds out of a country. Bitcoin, more broadly, is a cryptocurrency that's not a fiat currency. It's not created or controlled by a nation state. Now, that has some use cases. Perhaps that f um, f uh, Filipino nanny uh, can send money directly to their mom in the Philippines without paying 15%. So that gets more interesting. But the real pony here is none of that. Not the asset, not the currency. The real pony is the underlying distributed ledger technology. Because for the first time in history, people can now trust each other and transact peer to peer. And this is creating a great opportunity for the middle, people in the middle, to rethink their whole value proposition and the way that they operate to deliver better value to customers at a lower rate. Now, at this point, everyone who put up their hand in category one and category two, which is a vast majority of the people in this room, are saying, just a second, <laughs> how does that work? How do you trust each other without an intermediary? How can you transact without some kind of institution? So, Mark Twain. Remember, I'm sorry I wrote such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. It's taken me four years to say what I'm about to say to you in two and a half minutes. So any of you with a stopwatch, go for it. Time me, all right? This, and I'm going to use Bitcoin because that's how we started here, but then we'll move beyond that. This is how Bitcoin does that. That $1,000 that I sent to Hillary, that's broadcast, oh, I don't have the uh, thing here. Anyway, the sweet animation, I didn't bring it. Anyway, I'll tell you anyway. That's broadcast out to a global network 
of millions of computers all using the highest level of cryptography. And all around the world is a, um, a smaller group called miners. And these miners have huge computing power, estimated to be 20 to 50 times bigger than all of Google. And the miners do a lot of work to find out the truth. Um, and every 10 minutes, kind of like the heartbeat of a network, a block gets created, and that block has all the transactions from the last 10 minutes, the fact that I paid Hillary $1,000. Ultimately, it could be any transaction, the fact that somebody got married or someone registered a land title or uh, you uh, sold a stock directly to that person or that light bulb bought some power from a distributed power source, any transaction then the miners use all this computing power to validate the block. And the first miner to essentially achieve consensus is rewarded with some of the cryptocurrency from that blockchain, some Bitcoin in this case. And then, this is the important part, that block gets connected to the previous block with a timestamp, kind of like a digital wax seal. And if I wanted to hack that block and double spend that money, $1,000, and send it to you and you and you to commit fraud, I'd have to hack not just that block, but the previous block and every block in the chain, not just on one computer using the highest level of cryptography, but across millions of computers all around the world simultaneously um, while the most powerful computing resource in the world is watching me. Now, I'm not going to say that's unhackable, but that's tough. And it's infinitely more secure than the kinds of computer systems we have in our companies today. The way I like to think of it is that blockchain is like a highly processed thing, like a chicken McNugget, okay? And to hack it would be like trying to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now, somebody's going to be able to do that someday. But for now, uh, that's going to be tough. So that's how one kind of blockchain works. It's called a permissionless blockchain. Anybody can use it. And it uses a cryptocurrency as the way of achieving consensus of what is the truth. But there are all kinds of others. Hyperledger brought to you by the Linux Foundation, and IBM is a key uh, driver behind that, it b enables you to build permissioned blockchains where you get to, to say, say it's only the customers of our bank that are going to be able uh, to use this. And it's a different kind of consensus mechanism. Ethereum, created by 21-year-old Trontonian, Vitalik Buterin, is now worth over... Uh, a hundred, what is it? 12,000, oh, $1,235 for a single Ethereum, Ether. 1306. <laughs> I, I paused, I hesitated. Um, but this is the most successful startup in Canadian history. Most people in Canada wouldn't, wouldn't even know, but it's worth $100 billion or something like that. So Ethereum uses a similar consensus mechanism to Bitcoin, but they're moving to a different one that doesn't use all that energy. Um, and Ethereum's, now we're getting interesting, you see, Hyperledger and Ethereum, because think of Bitcoin as the first big app of the of blockchain. Kind of like email was the first big app of the internet, right? But then you had the web come along. You had these general purpose platforms that enabled you to build any app. And it, on Ethereum, you can build pretty much any app. And one of the ways of doing that is has this thing called smart contracts that are just kind of what, what they sound like. So JP Morgan, notwithstanding Jamie Dimon's uh, comments, about Bitcoin being fraud, although he, I hear he's now withdrawn those, um, is building a, a private implementation of Ethereum, which is called Quorum. 
And then you have R3, which is a partnership of 100 and something uh, large organizations, many of them financial services industry. Again, building ledgers and enabling people to build ledgers to do things in banking. Ripple has emerged as the second most valuable blockchain in terms of its currency. And um, it says that it can do transactions at the same speed as Visa. Now, that's a statement that would require some due diligence before you, uh, as a bank, uh, get rid of your bread and butter transaction systems. Then there are more and more interesting ones. Met Metronome, the world's first cross-blockchain cryptocurrency. Um, and they're about to launch. Cosmos, one of the founders is a Canadian. And Cosmos is the internet of blockchains, enabling blockchains to interact, with the goal not being mainly interoperability, but, but really throughput and volume. And Cosmos is an extraordinary um, it's an extraordinary thing. It uses uh, um, it's something called Byzantine fault tolerance. That sounds kind of Byzantine, I know, to, uh, as, as its uh, consensus mechanism. And then we got all these other things like uh, Aeon, an amazing Toronto initiative that um, they were scrambling for money a year ago, and now it's worth like hundreds of millions uh, of dollars. Uh, I'm meeting with the folks from ICON in uh, uh, Korea uh, tomorrow night. I'm giving a speech, and that's something that's worth billions of dollars. So there are, And these are all things that go beyond just a simple currency to create a whole bunch of value. So the hype machine is kicked into action. And uh, this really began with The Economist when they did a cover story almost two years ago. They called it the trust machine. Blockchain is the great chain of being sure about things. And they, they compared it. They were more hyperbolic than, I, than I'm being. I'm saying this is the second era of the internet. They, they said this is as big as the creation of double entry accounting. And any of you who are accountants know that was a really big deal. That was like 400 years ago and it was the foundation of the corporation and of capitalism. So if this is comparable with that, this is kind of um, a big deal. So, um, Alex and I uh, uh, wrote the book, and uh, the, it was probably a little bit premature, but I was um, uh, telling a couple of folks uh, before the meeting that the big dream review that any author, fiction or nonfiction, that you hope to get, uh, mainly, mainly nonfiction, for a, a book is from the New York Review of Books. I've written 15 books, I think twice in my life, maybe three times, the New York Review of Books has done a review of one of my books. And they're looking for Pulitzer Prize and all this kind of stuff. 19 months after this book came out, the New York Review of Books reviewed it, and it's in the current <laughs> issue. So um, I don't know, it was worth, uh, worth waiting for. But it's, I say that just to be reflective of the fact, or to reflect that, that this is just really kicking in right now. And um, uh, Chris Owen and I uh, from TD were talking about this before the, the uh, session, and it's really like this whole crypto craze has woken people up to the fact that, you know, Bob Dylan, there's something big going on here and you don't know what it is. Well, it turns out everyone thinks it's about crypto assets. It's not. It's the underlying technology. So let me finish by saying why I think that's true. And I'm going to share with you a little bit of the research, not just from the book, but from the Blockchain Research Institute. Um, we are a think tank based in Toronto, conducting 70, how many? A lot. 75 <laughs> projects. This is Hillary Carter, who's running the trains of all of those projects. Um, hurting the cats of all of those pro Anyway, each of them is headed by some kind of world's leading thinker. And, um, and we deliver um, the strategic insights in the form of reports and infographics and video and so on. And many of the, a, a bunch of the world's most important companies are members of that. So let me start uh, here with uh, wh what does all this do to the corporation itself? And um, does anybody an economist or know who Ronald Coase? Does that ring a bell, Ronald Coase? Do anybody here? Okay. So 
uh, 80 years ago, he wrote a paper, he's an economist, wrote a paper where he, he, put for, he asked a deceptively simple question. He said, why does the firm exist? He said, if Adam Smith is right and the open market's the best mechanism for allocating goods and resources and information and materials, why isn't everybody an independent contractor at every step along the way in production? Why do we have firms? And he said, the answer is, and he won a Nobel Prize for saying that, the answer is transaction costs. And he talked about four types of costs. The cost of search, of finding all the right assets, the right people, the right money, the right information in an open market. That'd be prohibitive. So you bring all that inside the boundaries of a firm where you have like uh, bank accounts, you have filing cabinets for finding information, org charts for finding people, and so on. The cost of coordination. Imagine trying to get all these people who've never met to work together to create something like a car. Totally prohibitive. Bring them inside the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford actually had within his boundaries a power plant, a steel mill, a shipping company, and a glass factory. Why? Because the costs of all these transactions in an open market were bigger than the costs of doing things inside the boundaries of the Ford Motor Company. Thirdly, the cost of contracting. Imagine if every little activity in the economy required a contract. That'd be prohibitive. And finally, the cost of establishing trust. You bring it inside a firm where you know people. You have compensation systems. You know if you do something untrustworthy that there's going to be a process whereby that becomes problematic. So the industrial age firm did do everything from soup to nuts. It was vertically integrated. Well, in the early, late 80s, early 90s, information technology began to make the boundaries of the firm more porous. And back then... Um, I wrote a book called Paradigm Shift. I said, I think the enterprise is becoming an extended enterprise. And then we saw the internet of information that further unbundled the firm. Cisco, our poem back then was focus on what you do best and partner to do your, the rest. Cisco used a network business model to create competitive advantage because the tonic of the market got brought to bear on every function within the corporation. Now what's going to happen? As blockchain absolutely devastates these four classes of transaction costs. Well, we think firms are going to start to look more distributed and decentralized, and they're going to look, start to look more like networks. Now to make this point, I'd like to just tell you a little story. In the book, we wondered well, we need a two-by-two, two, right? A taxonomy of firms affected by this technology. So we said, high com high, low to high complexity, low to high automation. The upper right, um, that would be a TD Bank working on with a whole bunch of distributed ledgers. It would be an open network enterprise, more high performance, better value, lower cost, and so on. It could also, um, there'd be lots of smart contracts that it would use to do that. Um, it could also start to have autonomous agents. AI is not going to be on some giant computer. It's, it will be distributed. Autonomous agents moving around on a blockchain. And we said, is it possible that you could have a firm that would be completely distributed and completely autonomous in the sense that it would have no people. You'd have no CEO, no management, no, no employees. It'd be a bunch of smart contracts and autonomous agents working on a blockchain. So we spent a few days thinking through how would that work and how would it raise money and how would it make decisions and how could you deal with moral hazard, you know, where managers make bad decisions, right, because it's in their interest but not in the interest of shareholders, all these kinds of things. And then we almost didn't publish it because we thought, this is too futuristic. You know, fine line between vision and hallucination. And, um, but we talked to the publishers, they said, go for it. People like to see that futuristic stuff. A week after the book came out, an organization was launched called the Distributed Autonomous Organization. And it had no CEO, no management, no people. It was a bunch of smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. It was a venture capital company. 
and its goal was to raise money and invest in companies in this space. So its first job, this thing with no people, was to raise money. And this thing held a crowdfunding campaign. We now call them ICOs. And in three weeks, it raised 164 million US dollars. And everyone's like, what's with that? That was an order of a magnitude bigger than any other crowdfunding campaign ever in the world. So those of you who know the story, who knows the story? Anybody here? It's not a happy ending uh, because there was a flaw in one of the smart contracts and a hacker was able to get in there and move $50 million from one part of this thing to another part where after a 28-day cooling off period, he could actually get the money out. Now he said, well, I'm not a hacker. I'm just abiding by the terms of the smart contract that allowed me to do this. And so a huge brouhaha happened, to make a long story short, the creators of this thing, who were humans, decided to give the money back. And there was a fork in Ethereum um, that resulted, and life went on. But the fact that that could exist for a few weeks, we're in the early days of some profound changes to the deep structure and architecture of the firm and of how we orchestrate capability in society. So I'm going to get this panel up here. I'm going to spend one minute each on eight new business models just to give you a feeling of where this is going. The sharing economy. I like to talk about how the big disruptors could be disrupted by this. So Uber, Airbnb, of course they're not sharing at all. I mean, they're successful precisely because they don't share. Right? They're service aggregators. And this created a $70 billion company called Uber. Now they both deliver great service, don't get me wrong, but please don't call them sharing economy companies. Well, could you create Super, Super Uber, distributed app, smart contracts, autonomous agents on a blockchain? Same with Airbnb. Isn't that what blockchains do? They help you identify, right? They help you do transactions. They are good at keeping records. Um, these are kind of the key things that the company of Airbnb or the company of Uber do. So you go on, you're looking for a good place in Toronto or Seoul, the Olympics, you find a place, book it. It's a database, right? It's in the ledger. Um, you show up, you turn your key or key in a number, that initiates partial payment in the smart contract. You go in, use some services, rent a movie or something, another payment into the smart contract. You exit, close the door, final payment's complete, you love the place, five star, it's on an illegible blockchain, and nobody can mess with that rating because it's tough to turn a chicken McNugget into a chicken. So um, there were no humans really required for any of that. It all, could all be done by software. Number two, there are big opportunities for prosperity. Maybe we'll get into this. In the, but we don't need to redistribute wealth in most countries. We could pre-distribute it. Just make the economy more democratic and enable people who create value to get compensated for the value they create. So there are all these people who create value and they don't receive it back. Um, Journalists, songwriters, artists, musicians, some scientists. I like to talk about the music industry because it's close to my heart. Um, if you wrote a hit song 35 years ago, a million singles, platinum song, you get 46,000 US dollars in royalties. You write a song that gets a million streams today, you get $35, which won't buy you a pizza at Il Frenello. OK, so it won't get you to the airport. So the Internet of Information broke our intellectual property regime because we took the stuff that was assets, like music, and the only tool we had for dealing with it was a publishing medium. So we published it. We printed songs. I did this. I sent MP3 files to my friends, and they sent stuff to me in. And this leaves the poor songwriter at the end getting crumbs. Well, Imogen Heap has now um, launched a platform, a British singer-songwriter, Grammy winner, called Mycelium. There's another one of a company called Consensus System in New Jersey called Ujo Music, where the songwriter puts their song 
on a blockchain music platform, and the song is inside a smart contract, and the smart contract protects their intellectual property rights. You want to listen to it, maybe it's free. You want to put it in a movie, the contract says, well, what do you want to do? You want it to be the theme song, you're going to have somebody sing it, it's a background, it's going to be a ringtone in the movie, I mean, and the smart contract collects the funds. The way Imogene uh, describes it is that the song, my song, acts as a business, and it's out there protecting my rights. Re-intermediaries. That story about the Filipino nanny is actually not a makeup story, it's a real one. So for 22 years, Anna Lee Domingo in Toronto, nanny housekeeper has been getting on the bus and the TTC cashier check back on the bus, subway goes to the Filipino mall where there's a Western Union office specializing in the Filipino diaspora. She sends her $500, she saves that much every month to her mom in the Philippines. Costs her around 11% average over all these years. Uh, it takes four to seven days, mom never knows when it's uh, going to arrive. Anna Lee Domingo, a year ago, went on to a platform. This one was called Abra. There's now a, a more sophisticated one based in Toronto called Paycase. And she sent her money direct from her mobile to her mom's mobile. And arrives there, and it looks like Uber. Her mom can see some tellers driving around. She sees a five-star teller. He's seven minutes away. Clicks on him. The guy shows up at the door. Gives her Filipino peso, she sticks it in her purse. It's a point and a half, the whole thing took minutes. So, Western Union has got to re intermediate. They got to create new value. And that's what Paycase is doing. It's a re intermediator. The opportunity is to create new value in the middle, probably bigger than the old middle, but typically the leaders of the old middle don't create the new one. That's the law of re intermediation. Supply chains will move to blockchains. We're working with some of the biggest supply chains in the world in the BRI that are actively exploring moving their entire platform. Think about a courier company or a massive electronics manufacturer moving all of this. And when you move something to a, to a blockchain, it's just better. You, you, it's more secure, it's faster, and you have what we call a network state where you can see everything that's happening at once and get ready for crazy, crazy stuff that's coming. Just Google these guys. I, don't, I can talk about them in the panel if you want. It's called Sweetbridge. Uh, full disclosure, I love this company so much, I'm actually going to buy some stock and become an advisor. Um, but Sweetbridge enables you to monetize your own supply chain. So even though you don't have the money to pay your suppliers, until later, you can pay them now. <laughs> they, you generate your own funds from your own supply chain. You're sort of borrowing against yourself, basically. And if, they, if this works, this will become a whole new operating platform for a $64 trillion business, because that's what the global supply chain is. The physical world is becoming smart and interconnected. The Internet of Things We'll need a ledger of things. So now we've got these great uh, LO3 Energy, uh, great companies uh, that are creating a distributed power grid where you buy power from your wherever, from your neighbor, if that's an appropriate source. And you, uh, ultimately, your light bulb will buy power. And when your light bulb pays for the power, its reputation as a trustworthy light bulb will be enhanced. And um, light bulbs are going to care a lot about their reputation because they're going to get in a lot of trouble if they have a bad reputation. They're not going to get power. And if you're a light bulb, that really sucks. So um, this is all intelligence that's being based into these distributed networks. Although in Ontario, we don't have a problem, really, with power, especially if you have a cottage. It's so cheap. Um, I digress. Platform builders. So there are all these companies that are building extraordinary new platforms. I just wanted to say a thing about financial services. And this is not to be, <laughs> this is just more of a joke. Do you know what this is? What kind of, the name of this machine? Sorry? Yeah. It has a name. Rube Goldberg, thank you. Is that you, David? <laughs> 
Rube Goldberg was an American engineer, and he invented all these ridiculously complicated machines that would do a real simple thing like crack an egg or open a door. And, you know, knowing what we know today, that's kind of what the financial industry <laughs> looks like, isn't it? You know, you crack, you uh, crack an egg. You tap your card in a Starbucks, and a bunch of messages go through these companies, each with the old technology and each with a counterparty risk. And that's what almost got us in 2008. And each with delay and each with cost. And then three days later, a clearing and settlement occurs. Well, imagine if the banks embraced um, a payment system based on di a distributed ledger technology. There would be no three-day settlement period because the payment and the settlement would be the same activity. You could also have micropayments. You could have um, not just real-time settlement. You could have a single version of the truth. Because right now, everybody's got a different version of the truth in a lot of these, uh, these situations. You could build no knowledge into payments. Payments could become smart. It's like money can become smart. You send some money to your kid at university. You hope it gets spent on tuition and books. Well, in the future, you send smart money to your kid, and it will be spent on tuition and books and other pre-authorized things and not in the bar. So um, I don't have time to do this, but you, you all got the book. Chapter uh, 3 is an extraordinary uh, chapter. I didn't write it. Um, my co-author did. But he, he went and said, what is it that the financial industry does? And this is, this is it. I mean, they authenticate who you are, that's an asset. They move around value. And because they move value, they get to store value. Because they store value, they get to lend value. Then they exchange all this value, do transactions. They create markets, stock markets, and so on. They fund and invest value, um, venture capital, investment banking, mutual funds, hedge funds, and so on. They insure value and manage risk. And they audit for and account for value. So. The real smart bankers, we have one coming up in a panel, the SEC, uh, know that each of these, there's an opportunity to uh, use this technology to streamline things. But also, there's a threat um, uh, from this uh, technology from new incumbents that are enabled by it. So self-criticism. In the book, we said investment banking, sorry, venture capital will be unrecognizable in five years. Well, we were really wrong. More money was raised in one year, this year, um, through ICOs, initial coin offerings, than all venture capital, through almost $3 billion uh, US dollars. So is that a fantastic thing, enabling Canada to build an innovation economy and escape from the, the, uh, the throat lock of the old venture capital industry? Or is it a way for fraudsters and crazy people to raise a whole bunch of stupid money for companies that are all going to fail? Well, the truth is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and there sure are lots of stupid companies that are going to fail. There's also lots of fraud. I mean, criminals are always the first to embrace new technologies, from the automobile to the cell phone. But this is a really big opportunity overall. And it's reflective of the fact that there are big, big changes in the way coming from inside the industry, but also outside, if they don't change. In the BRI, we just finished a gorgeous paper, I think, about the global payment system. Are wondering where would SWIFT, SWIFT that does trillions of transactions, I think trillions, transactions um, a week, where is SWIFT going to be washed away by all of this? So what would SWIFT have to do to reinvent itself? Big data is about to change. I'm not going to go into that now, but uh, you're all going to have your personal identity on a blockchain. And it's going to collect data, not Facebook. And so um, and if you're at a hospital, well, we'll let uh, David Jaffrey's here from UHM. We'll let him talk about that and how that's going to work. And governments can use this technology to finally, to bring about big changes to the architecture of government. We can help address the crisis of legitimacy of our democratic institutions. You can have smart votes, where your vote is inside a smart contract. Politicians need to be accountable to the citizens, not to the funders that put them in power. And the central banks 
This year you will see some of the big countries, their central banks will announce that they are embracing blockchain for their fiat currencies. Well, we have the digital dollar in Canada, I don't know, this year, but it will come. And that would deliver central bankers all kinds of powerful new tools. So those are eight out of dozens. And uh, this is a time of big change. I was going to go through this list, but I won't. But let's say there are a whole bunch of problems. Um, and what we did, uh, this is from the book, what we did is we went through and we analyzed each of these. And we, we had a discipline. It's got to go in bucket number one or bucket number two. Bucket number one is reasons why this whole blockchain revolution is a bad idea and we shouldn't do it. Bucket number two, implementation challenges. And all of these, it turns out, end up in implementation challenges. So to close, I think this is a new paradigm. And a paradigm puts mental models, uh, uh, is a mental model, and they, 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 they create boundaries uh, around things that we don't even know that they're there, and assumptions that we don't even know that they're there. The Earth is at the center of the universe. The big problem in the world is communism. Remember that one? The purpose of computing is to automate existing business processes with the goal of reducing headcount. And something can come along, art, science, culture, technology, that causes a change to occur. And that's what we've got today. Can we do this in Canada? Well, that's a good question um, on the panel. Um, it turns out that we're probably the center of the global blockchain revolution, right here in the um, blockchain corridor. We call it the golden horseshoe, pretty much. And we have an enormous opportunity in this country. But ultimately, the future, I don't know, it's not something to be predicted. <laughs> it's something to be achieved. And um, if we keep charging the way that we are now, um, maybe this uh, smaller, more distributed world that our kids inherit may actually be a better one. So thank you very much. Thanks for much time. Super. OK, great. I just lost my microphone. There we go. Oh, thank you so much, Don. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. And um, we are uh, going to bring up some, um, some practical practitioners and some academics and uh, invite Don to come back and uh, join us here. Um, so why don't I, without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll start in, uh, in the order and kind of uh, lay them out here. Actually, Don, why don't you come up here and Don? Why don't you, you can come up first, and because we've already introduced you. Um, but then I'll uh, actually, why don't I just have everyone come, come on up here, and I'll introduce you uh, one at a time. I'll start with um, Dr. Uh, David Jaffrey, who is uh, Dr. Jaffrey is the Executive Vice President of Technology and Innovation at uh, the University Health Network. Uh, why don't you, you can sit right in there. Your Don will put you at the you at the far end there. Um, He's also a professor in the Department of Radiology, Oncology, and Medical Biophysics and the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto. He's a board-certified medical physicist, and his primary area of research has been in the development and application of image-guided cancer therapy. He was formerly the head of radiation physics at the Princess Margaret Hospital and a senior scientist within the Ontario Cancer Institute. Dr. Jaffrey holds the Findani Chair in Radiation Physics is the director of Techna, the Techna Institute of Health Technology and Development at the University Health Network. Dr. Jaffrey has won each of the major prizes in the field of medical physics. His current research interests focus on the development of imaging technologies and methods with a focus on image-guided interventions, uh, including radiation therapy, drug delivery, and surgery. Dr. Jaffrey, this goes on for a while. No, yeah, we'll, we'll cut to the chase on this. So. It's okay, we're good. The, the one that I got is, anyway, it's, it's three times as long as this. Um, he's a very accomplished gentleman. And uh, uh, Dr. Jaffrey is currently focusing on digitally enabling Canada's largest research hospital and is a significant advocate for the potential information technology's impact on healthcare in Canada. So, Welcome, and thank Pleasure you very much for joining us.
Okay. Let's, uh, so I've, I've, I've invited, I've invited uh, along with Don, I've invited uh, two what I call practical practitioners and two academics. And each of them bring a, uh, a slightly uh, different perspective uh, to this dialogue, which is why I asked them all to uh, participate. Uh, I'll now ask um, uh, Dr. Merrick Lakowski who, uh, to join us. He is a professor at uh, York University. He co-founded the Blockchain Lab at the Schulich School of Business, where he teaches data science at the graduate level, as, where, as, as well as blockchain application development. He is also a faculty member in the Blockchain Research Institute, and is a consultant for blockchain startups using Hyperledger and Ethereum. He's also very active in building out standards in the blockchain space, including the blockchain standard for digital assets for the National Institute of Standards and Technology and cross-border business process standards with the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business. Dr. Laskowski is a leading researcher in the blockchain space and is a pioneer of technologies that augment blockchain values such as on-chain analytics and artificial intelligence. Okay. Now, next. <laughs> but the, the problem for, you know, with inviting a whole bunch of people with lots of letters after their name is that it takes a long time to introduce them. Um, next is uh, Dr. Adi Mashatan, who is a professor at the School of Information Technology Management at Ryerson University. Her research focuses, focus has been on information system security and privacy. Uh, prior to joining Ryerson University, Dr. Mashtan was a senior information security consultant and solutions architect with CIBC with a focus on cryptology and enterprise architecture where she led numerous solution design, implementation, and validation of speech projects. Prior to that, Dr. Mashtan was a scientific collaborator with the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne where she conducted research on design and analysis of cryptographic protocols by means of mathematical tools. Dr. Mashtan's research is focused on information technology management and business process modeling. She's doing fascinating work, which I've had the great privilege of sitting in her office and, and, and learning all about, um, asking the question, if a business has access to new technology infrastructure, such as blockchain, uh, that incorporates identity and trust, what kinds of business models do you implement? She's also a cryptology expert, and she's working on the impact of quantum computing on large and medium-sized businesses, as well as building quantum uh, resistant cryptology on blockchain. Uh, so, well, and by the way, and by the way, she has a two month old at home. Uh, <laughs> I, and, and she's been incredibly generous to, to uh, venture out on an evening like this to, to join us here. Although maybe it's great to get out of the house. <laughs> uh, finally, um, our second practical practitioner is uh, Chris Owen, who's the Vice President of Enterprise Platforms Blockchain at the TD Bank, where he's responsible for managing TD's interest and activities related to blockchain. Um, this is a new role, and uh, which was specifically created to bring focus and ex executive attention to the opportunities enabled and presented by blockchain technology and distributed ledgers. Chris also watches over TD's blockchain investment portfolio, which includes a wide variety of transformative business and technical initiatives. During his 30-year career in IT, Chris has spent much of his time operating as a consultant executive for firms such as IBM, Mutual of New York, KPMG, Bearing Point, and various roles including systems engineering and technical sales to um, strategy consulting and business architecture. Chris has been at TD since 2008, has led M&A activities, helped build TD's direct uh, channels uh, organization, uh, which delivers electronic channel solutions across all of TD's business divisions and uh, customers and provided executive oversight to a number of large IT programs. Prior to assuming his current role, he's held uh, the position of VP and head of the office of the CIO, where he championed TD's IT strategy refresh and launched a follow-on program designed to specifically accelerate the transition, uh, the, the transition from strategy to execution. Um, Chris is a very practical, you know, kind of leave the hype at the door sort of realist. Um, and when I first asked him to participate, and many times since then, he has kind of warned me off, <laughs> saying, uh, suggesting that uh, I better, you know, uh, uh, be wary of what I, I wish for. So uh, he's, he has forewarned me uh, about his uh, candidness, and uh, I think uh, this is going to be great fun. So um, thank you very much. 
So I think I'd like to start this, uh, this dialogue by kind of going, uh, by, by attacking the topic in kind of the thematic sort of way and uh, first talk about uh, building on some of the, the comments that Don made and talk about uh, impacts. Um, and I suppose the, the biggest question is, uh, as you all look at this space from your respective uh, positions, where are the, the biggest places do you think that, uh, that this technology is going to impact uh, I suppose more broadly, but specifically in the particular areas that uh, that you've been uh, spending time on. So, David, you're in the uh, the healthcare industry. You're obviously doing a lot of work with electronic healthcare records and uh, supply chain issues and many others. Uh, how do you see it uh, impacting your organization? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, the perspective that uh, I've taken on this is that uh, in healthcare, uh, data is of course critical to everything we do and. Um, and uh, that, that, that digital quantity, that value associated with that digital information is something that is, is currently trapped uh, in, in for many paradigms, whether it's a clinician paradigm or the patient paradigm. And as someone who's done research in the hospital, um, access to that information from a research perspective um, is very challenging. And if uh, done, done that for several years in the hospital. And several years ago, after looking at a book that, written by somebody named Don Topscott called uh, Wakenomics, <laughs> I, I kind of started to ask the question around why, why doesn't everybody contribute to information and we all share the, the value associated with what you contribute. Uh, but the machinery has never been there to do that. And uh, when, when blockchain uh, technology came around, you realize there's an opportunity to everybody to participate. Uh, in the ownership associated with, with the flipping bits of life, uh, including the data that's collected in the process of healthcare. And there's a great interest in industry to learn as much as possible from every single patient to make new therapeutics, to improve outcomes, to make better informed decisions, to aggregate measurements like we've never been able to aggregate before. And so when you bring a technology along that, that lowers the transactional costs, and gives you a trust framework that allows that information to be held and shared with others with well-defined terms. Uh, it opens up enormous opportunity for us to learn about life and healthcare um, from the process of delivering care. And that's central to a research hospital, which is what the University Health Network is. And from a research hospital perspective, we see this shift where people own their data. They own it, they manage it, they want to make use of it, it's a value. The government paying for our health care is building an asset that I own in the future. And I may, may you know, bequeath it to my children and generations and generations after that and become incredibly valuable. My, my sequence, my medical data, the phenotypic characteristics of my life, so much information, including even my activities, start to meld together. And when you think about chaining this together and it being an owned asset, it is a significant shift in the paradigm. And it starts with something simple. Let's give patients access to their data. And so our project, one of our little projects right now, is just using this kind of technology to give people confidence that they can actually control their data and it can be used, it can be, uh, it can be used in a transactional framework, and it can be trusted. And that real sh really shifts the dynamic between the patient and the provider and the insurer and the government and the pharma companies and the entire economy of data comes to life in this paradigm. And I think this is really interesting for us. So we're thinking about what it means when we can't hoard the data like Don talk, talks about as a healthcare organization and learn from it. When it's gotta be shared by and co-owned, it really changes the paradigm. So, so this, this paradigm shift, and, and uh, I, I hear this idea that the, the, the patient or the citizen or the customer is kind of now at the center, and they have a, a control over the information that, um, you know, whether it's their healthcare record or whether it's their financial records or whether it's their social reputation, um, that they, with this technology, have kind of a central point of control, number one. And number two, because of this technology's ability to tokenize value, that there are these new kinds of, um, you know, business models that you kind of alluded to where information has value. And if you're at the center and at the control point of that, of, how, of owning that information, that some of that value may in fact flow to you. Um, so how, you know, in that kind of world, what does that really mean for us? And, and more broadly, is that, you know, what does it mean for, for researchers that are looking to 
you know, introspect large corpuses of, of medical information to come up with the next cures for, for cancer and such. I mean, how does this all kind of sort out? Well, I mean, there's a pivot that has to happen where people start to realize that it's their information and they can control it. That's a shift that we're not quite ready for. But once you get around that idea that it's something you can manage uh, and it's your asset, then you'll start to work that. So that's a social shift that has to come, and that'll take some time. Um, in that paradigm, we see a future where uh, organizations build cohorts of people where they've entered into contracts to access their data, not much different than the music paradigm that Don talked about, where you can use my information to explore the value of that drug, um, but I expect some return on that. And uh, the idea that when you go to a hospital and this information is collected, uh, why would I put it in the hospital? Why wouldn't I put it in a separate asset that, uh, location that is controlled by me? Uh, why would I let the hospital interpret that image? Why wouldn't I have a contract with a radiologist that could be virtual for all I know um, and generate second opinions quite comfortably? And the whole economy uh, of the operation on that data and the value derived from the measurement for the benefit of that patient, it, it comes to life. It's an entire economy. So we're even thinking about how do we have people bring data back to our organization to make that data more valuable for them. A second opinion is a perfect example of the kinds of frameworks that could be operated. Chris, you know, you, you've, um, in discussions we've had, you, you often talk about kind of putting the customer at the center of things and along some of these very same sorts of themes. How do you see this phenomena playing out in the financial services space? So I, I think in the financial services banking space, uh, conceptually, it's exactly the same way that David described it. We've met before, and it was interesting to see how aligned our, our philosophical views were of this. At the end of the day, each person, each customer has as a number of fingerprints. They have a medical fingerprint, and that's where you can accumulate all of their medical data and medical history. They've got a financial fingerprint. Their financial transactions over their lifetime creates a fing fingerprint, and, and you can extrapolate the, the, the line and the trajectory of the line and make some, some learned predictions about where they're headed and what's likely next. Uh, you've, got a, you've got a government fingerprint in your identity and all of the things and services you consume from the government. Uh, you have uh, a professional and academic fingerprint where you track the courses you've taken and the accredited, accreditized uh, degrees and things that you've accumulated. Um, it's all the same. It's your data. It's your history. You should own it. Um, and you should grant permission and access to whoever you think is a, as a, an authorized user of that accumulated suite and, and wealth of data. So it doesn't matter whether the context and the use case is a medical one or a financial one. Uh, the, prim the principle is essentially the same. It's the customer's data. They should control it, and they should uh, grant, grant permission to it over time. So, so, so Mary, I mean, building off this, this idea, you know, we, there's so many business models that exist today that are, are based on large data corpuses, whether it's um, artificial intelligence or whether it is, um, you know, big data analytics, advanced analytics, and there's, there's huge companies with massive business models that are built on this. In this kind of world where people are now kind of at the center um, of everything and that data is kind of attached to their identity and they have the ability to both control it and to monetize it uh, in any way that they see fit, what, you know, what, what happens to those business models and what kinds of, of analytics or, or big data technologies are being prepared for this world? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, as you mentioned, it's, it is going to let you know people gain control over their data and monetize it. I think what it will do, you know, the promise of blockchain is uh, is, a, is a disruptive technology and a, a disintermediating technology. So that suggests that uh, you know these these monolithic. Uh, business models that are based on exploiting the, you know, the data of, uh, you know, their customers are, they're going to have to change. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In what way? <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I, I see, uh, you know, first of all, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, you know, whereas right now, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, companies are gaining, uh, you know, money through, through, through selling uh, individuals' data as well as, uh, as advertising. Uh, you know, one of the promises of this, uh, you know, Internet of Value that uh, Don mentioned earlier is uh, in order to, uh, for, um, you know, individual consumers to be able to make microtransactions with, with these services instead of uh, effectively renting out their data. That might be one possible 
vision. There's a, a couple examples right now uh, that have uh, you know recently uh, startups that have recently uh, gained funding. One of them is the uh, basic attention token, and there's uh, there's others as well that are you know working towards uh, allowing people to monetize their data, as you suggested. Okay, um, so Addy, a lot of the work that um, that you've shared with me um, that, that you're doing at Ryerson has been about you know kind of that, that, that fundamental question that says, well, uh, listen, all business networks and business models are fundamentally built on the infrastructure available to them at any given point in time. And that was true of road systems and rail systems and electricity and, and, all the, and, and the regulatory environment, all those kinds of things. And to the point that Don was making earlier, we have, as a, f a function of the internet, the internet's a wonderful way of discovering information, but we just haven't had this trust protocol in place. So a lot of the work that you were working on was kind of asking the question, okay, if I have a trust infrastructure, if I've got this new thing, how do you really fundamentally redesign a business or a business process? And uh, you know, through some of that work, through some of that, that academic research, you were looking at a number of particular industries that you thought would be impacted. So how would you ask to ans answer the question I was asking to David about you know, where do you see this, these, these new kinds of, of business processes, these new kinds of business models emerging in which industries? So um, it's a very interesting question, and I can answer it a few different ways. Uh, one way would be wherever you see a process that is very manually intensive, and people are looking at the data, everybody talked about data, from their own point of view, and they have different versions of the truth that Don mentioned. This could be a good candidate for a blockchain implementation because you would have only one version of the truth and you can automate it. So you, there's, a, there's value in doing that. You get efficiency and you get, uh, um, uh, basically, you can, you don't have to reconcile because there's only one version of the truth and that is going to save you a lot of money. So wherever you see that, then you, you would consider that use case, that scenario, as a good candidate. Now, of course, you have to do more due diligence to see if it makes sense. And I know um, Chris has a, a suitability criteria, which I love, but I don't want to take air out of his balloon. So, so you, you, you would- You're you, not licensed to use it, though. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so you would have to look at every single um, uh, aspect of whether it makes sense in terms of how much it would cost to go on a blockchain implementation, how much uh, you would need to uh, basically invest in to maintain that blockchain, and then subtract that from what it costs now in terms of headcount, uh, investment that you would have to invest in your infrastructure and everything else. So what you gain and what you lose, basically. Right? And um, in, in particular, we looked at some uh, industry verticals that we found uh, blockchain technology to actually provide um, a great value. One was real estate, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about it because it's the one that we spent most time with, together with my MBA student, uh, Zach Roberts. Um, the other one was e-government, and e-health was uh, part of that. So uh, a lot of the government uh, processes are really manually intensive, and uh, they, uh, the government has a lot of data about you, so data is an issue there. And um, who doesn't want a, a leaner government? Everyone, right? We're we're paying them, we're funding them. So that's another use case we've looked at. Um, financial industry, obviously. So I don't need to mention uh, more about that. People talked about it already in the panel, and Don mentioned. And everybody, you know, the first thing you think about when you think about blockchain implementation is the financial industry. So that's that. A, a, a use case that um, we're we're working on, and it's it doesn't really come to your mind. It's not the first that you would think of is critical incident management where your first responders um, are, let's say, uh, reacting to a fire, uh, to a critical incident, it could be a terrorist activity. Um, and and uh, citizens are also reacting to, to, to it as well. They take it to Twitter to mention, oh, fire is coming from this, this way, don't go that way. And there's a lot of data that is um, aggregating and it's not authenticated. And one of the um, ways we can make sure that you, know, you can it's, it's a friend or foe situation, just like the army. Who is giving you authenticated information? Who's not? 
we can use blockchain technology to provide that kind of mechanism. And it's, uh, this, this scenario is a little bit different from the rest of them, so that one I really find interesting as well. Going back to the first one that I wanted to talk about a little bit more was the real estate. So when there's a real estate transaction, I'm sure everybody is familiar with at least a residential uh, real estate transaction, um, you have so many participants who are um, involved. So you have the seller, you have the buyer, everybody has a real estate agent, everybody has a lawyer, and you have the bank, and you have the insurer, and you have the uh, appraiser. So all of these people, they have their own version of the truth. And all of them are store, store, basically storing the data, um, and, and they have to reconcile. And you see signed papers are being manually um, careered that day of the transaction. So this is a very good candidate for saving some costs and also getting rid of some of, some of these intermediaries that, that you don't really need. Um, if you can reduce or, you know, doing it correctly, just forget about all these fraud scenarios that are possible in, in the current way you do a real estate transaction, do we really need um, um, insurance? Do we, do we really need title insurance? So these are the type of questions we ask in the real estate uh, scenario, and, and we saw that there's a lot of opportunities, not just about saving, but <coughs> fraud reduction was the big thing in, in, in what we found in, in the real estate uh, use case. So, so obviously there's lots of uh, efficiency that we can talk about in terms of the business process, but fraud resistance was something that uh, we, we, uh, we could really point out and say this is the big thing, this is the big impact in this particular use case. So that, that, that question of do you really need and you know, all the disintermediation that, that Don was talking about before, um, you know, the, 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 this, these, these constructs of these smart contracts and the ability to embed business logic into those smart contracts does, if you kind of follow it to its logical uh, conclusion, lead you to the the, the possibility or the probability that these new kinds of organizations emerge that are distributed autonomous enterprises. Uh, and we, we have seen a number of you know, Uber-like and Airbnb-like organizations that have started to emerge in this kind of space. Um, but it, it kind of begs the question in terms of this, this impact question about new entrants versus incumbents. Uh, you know, we've seen this model play over at the dawn of a new disruptive technology. So, so Don, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, when you, when you kind of look forward uh, at, you know, what kind of comes out of this, this new fundamental infrastructure disruption, do you think that it's going to be, you know, the new entrants, the, 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 the Facebooks and the Googles and the Ebays and the Amazons, that kind of emerged out of nowhere into the internet world and established completely new ways of doing business? Um, and or do you think that there are going to be incumbents that are able to kind of internally transform themselves, achieve certain efficiencies of, of process uh, through process automation and, and automated decision making and or the integration into some more distributed uh, ecosystems that allow them to participate in increasingly niche marketplaces. What, what do you think the, the, the balance is going to be and what, the, what are the prospects for a lot of the incumbents uh, in this new world? Could, could I just, I've spoken a lot, um, just throw it back um, on a previous question for a second. Sure. So I'm so inspired by David and Chris <laughs> who have these there's a, but, there's a button in here somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, there is. It's coming. Um, who have these, you know, real serious operational responsibilities with critical organizations, a bank and the biggest hospital network, saying data of our customers ought to belong to the customers. I think there's a whole bunch of reasons from a social point of view of, for doing that. But surely, don't you get back? And, and I, I'm supportive of that. I want to make it happen. Sign me up. But, but don't, don't, you, don't you, on the other hand, get, well, what do you mean? I mean, we created this data. It's our, or, or we're the ones that create the context whereby this data could occur. We create a hospital. We tested the people. We ought to own the data, and we're the ones who know what to do with it best. But we're a bank, you know? We need that data to, to, uh, to deliver good services and customize our services to, to the companies. The Facebook is like, yeah, well, you may have created the data, but 
you get to use all this stuff for free, so we get to, we get to own the data. I mean, how do you counter that kind of uh, 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 argument? And how do we go forward here with some kind of new model around data? Th that was exactly the essence of my question. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you just said yeah. it way better than I did. Can, can, sure. I, can I just I, answer the question or the question? No. I, I, th I think, Don, in, in addition to that, you know, there's a, there's a technological um, sort of uh, element or dimension to that where, uh, you know, um, you know I, I love my mom, God bless her, uh, gave her an iPad, new iPad for Christmas, and, you know, within 15 minutes she forgot the code to it and, like, the, the pin code to it. Now imagine if that was her health record or her bitcoins or something like that, right? Because there's no third trusted third party, those are potentially gone or inaccessible now? Well, yeah, I think there's going to have to be some sort of infrastructure that allows us to recover credentials. And I think that, you know, amongst other people, the, the, the banks and the federal government are working on digital identity mechanisms that are going to have to have those kinds of attributes. So, I mean, I'm reasonably confident that we'll be able to kind of tackle that. And certainly, uh, you know, we hear all these stories about people that have vast amounts of Bitcoin in their wallets that they can't get access to because they bought them, you know, five years ago and they've got no idea what their password was at the time. So we'll obviously have to have systems that, that, that deal with that. But I think that the core of the question that, that Dong was kind of asking is that, you know, in this new world where you know, identity and, you know, your control of what is associated with your identity is now not only potentially controllable by you, but even monetizable by you. What happens to a lot of the existing incumbent business models that have been built up with a completely different way of looking at the world? I think, I think the side contract and the side contract on the side contract and the side contract on the side contract is going to be this real expansion. I mean, you have to you, th you think about the engagement that's required. Once you have that asset, it has to be worked, um, that digital asset. And how do you work that asset? And I mean, the side contract conversations are going to be things that are derived from that asset. You're not going to derive it only from your asset. It's going to be combined with other assets, just like we see these mixing in music. Um, same thing as we pull together uh, a prediction for cancer cure. It's drawn from thousands of patients and thousands of genomes. I mean, this intellectual property and data as assets starts to roll forward under contractual frameworks. And the laws of Europe require us to unpack that as well. So there's a, there's a big reliance that, that these contracts can be stacked on, on top of each other. So you're going to do a deal with UHN that if I am found unconscious at an accident, any certified medical personnel can have full access to my data. That kind you of could, thing? You could arrange that. But a simple one that yeah. we're working on right now is it, it takes, it takes part of, uh, of the Snapchat paradigm. So our, our first activity around blockchain and the patient portal, the little experiment's not running yet, we're just working on a use case, is that who's going to trust somebody, who's going to trust themselves, the, the 90 year old grandmother, or however old she happens to be, um, <laughs> uh, basically, you know, is going to, is, um, like, is it my job to manage this data? I don't really think I'm in a position to manage this data. So we're doing a little experiment that hasn't been cooked out yet, which is to say, well, here's your data, and you're going to let someone see that data once, and then once they see it, they're not going to be able to see it again. That's a contract. And also very well known as Snapchat. And it's remarkable how people are willing to share data if they can keep control. And it's a really interesting, simple paradigm. Can you imagine just having a glimpse at the record, but no more? And once you do that paradigm, you could try, well, I'll try something else. And, and I think humans are so creative, they will start to push the kinds of contracts they'll want to arrange. The framework to support that contract and grow it in layers and layers, that's going to be quite, uh, quite challenging. But I think it's, un, it's, it's inevitable. Yeah, I, I, I was asking Chris to. Uh, so, so what, I, what I find interesting about, about this conversation is, is um, that uh, the question that you ask is typical of the kinds of questions that I, I, get, I, get, uh, I see on a daily basis, where we talk about the world and the art of the possible. And then people immediately resort to, well, all of the different obstacles and all the reasons why that won't work. So are you telling me you're going to you're going to have access to the data and 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 only you you and only you can can authorize uh, someone else's access or permission to use that data? Well, what about if it's in your well-being? What about if there's an outbreak of SARS in the community and it's important that the government and the network of hospitals hospitals see this contagion and where it's spreading and all those kinds of things? 
you don't know enough about how we can take that value and turn it into value. I don't think, I think the, the, the key question here is, or the key concept is, there's no one easy answer to any of these questions. It's an ongoing uh, debate about what's the, right, what's the right business model, what's the right scenario, what's the right use case, what's the, where is permission the appropriate thing to allow? Uh, is, it, is it black and white shades of gray? Uh, it's a very complicated space. And, and, and you probably know that better than any of us because, because you, you paint the art of the possible. You envision 20 years, 30 years from now what the world could, could look like based on a shared ledger technology that where your data can, can, can co-reside in a central place along with a competitor's data, but your data can be kept safe. Uh, just imagine the world of the opportunity in this world, and, and your, your mind starts spinning. That's 30 years out. And then all of a sudden you pinch yourself, you wake up from this slumber, and you, and you think about where I'm at today, and you realize how dramatically far I am today from that utopian world that we envision enabled by a shared ledger and blockchain. And uh, so I, 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 you know, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated space. I often joke with people that, that they say, well, tell me all you can about Bitcoin, you got 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes doesn't even crack the crack the crack the jar on the on the topic. You can you can have a three hour conversation. It could go in twelve different directions, and it often does. And you walk away scratching your head, thinking about about you know a, a complex mix of of of, of, uh, of things. Um, the 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 other point I want to make, Doug, if I may, is is uh, people talk about okay, well, where's the business case? Where's the opportunity in in finance for blockchain? And, and invariable, invariably, people talk about, about the hot spots of, of use cases in financial services. They talk about global payments. They talk about the sending my nanny's money back to India or Singapore or wherever it may be. Oh, horrible, beautiful use case getting rid of the horrible bureaucracy and nonsense that, that, that people ha are subjected to today. Uh, international wires and payments. Uh, capital markets. There are countless use cases in the capital market securities world where, where lots of different people are, are participating in a transaction. They only see their own little slice of the puzzle. It might be 5% of the puzzle, 6%, 7%, 10% of the end-to-end -end transaction. And, and, and no one until the, the transaction is complete and some reconciliation party pulls all the disparate together, massages it into one end-to-end -end transaction and plays it out to people. Now it's a, it's a consummated transaction and you can update your books of record. And that takes, in a very simple case where I want to buy 100 shares of IBM, that takes T plus 3. Why in the world, if I'm a seller of 100 shares of IBM, Don's the buyer, we can quickly agree to a price, why in the world does it take three days to settle that account? <laughs> it's madness. There are countless use cases today in the financial services world to uh, achieve operational efficiencies. And, and my point, my position is that blockchain is no different than any other technology that preceded it. What happens with new technology is people think about that, they digest it in the context of what they know and understand today. How can I take that technology, that innovation, and apply it to what I do today and make it faster and cheaper? And for the first 85, 90% of the activity and, and, and time in a new innovation, it's going to be occupied thinking about it that way. What excites me about this platform and this enabling technology is what Don talks about. It talks about you know, the, the enablement of a quantum leap improvement in process efficiency, new business models, entirely new things that had, have yet been unimagined. And 20 years from now, we're going to look back on this day and we're going to shake our head and laugh at ourselves for how close-minded we were because, because you're going to see use cases just, you know, blossom that, that you would never have imagined today thinking forward. So that's, that's, that's what, I, what I find interesting about, okay, well, what about the questions about the data and who has access? They'll get ironed out. They'll get ironed out. You know, things like, things like the, uh, the Equifax uh, breach, the Uber breach, that has incrementally convinced the consumers, the individual people out there, that, you know what, people are taking my data and they're, they're being reckless with it. Well, well, you know, I've, I've, had, I've had people come to me and say, who authorized you, the bank, to take my data and put it into an Equifax repository? 
So I'm sorry to say, but it was you. Page seven of the loan agreement, there's that little box, you checked it off, said it was okay for me to do that. Now, that, that's not right, that's, but what, it, what, this, what this whole breach, uh, the effect of this whole breach is to enlighten and ed educate a consumer. That they say, okay, you know what, that's valuable, that's important information. I'm gonna treat that a little bit more responsibly than I have in the past when I get to page seven. Maybe I'm gonna ask a few questions before I check that box. Little by little, increment by increment, we're gonna migrate into a world where people are gonna operate differently and, and it's gonna be a weird and wonderful place. Hmm. So, it's a bit of a brand. I expect more doom and gloom. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I think one of the, one of the, cha one of the kind of challenges that, that gets in the way of, of, of answering my own question and, and uh, is a bias that at least I and I think a number of other people kind of bring to this dialogue is that we make certain assumptions about the cost of contracting, right? And I mean that in kind of a big broader sense. And if you kind of get beyond your assumptions about how burdensome and difficult it is to contract in a kind of a reliable way and you realize that you can now contract in incredibly granular ways, very inexpensively, and to the point that, David, you were making, combine all kinds of conditional logic about how and when and where and what situations that that, that contract can execute and interleaf with other kinds of contracts, that you actually can start solving some of the problems that we're talking about. That if you get your head around that suddenly transactions and contracting, the cost of those things falls to such a point where you can do it in incredibly granular ways, then all kinds of weird and wonderful things are possible. So right. let's just talk quickly about um, what's going to get in our way, right? So, you know, Chris, you you showed me this your, your 14 reasons that, uh, that that blockchain or distributed ledger technology is going to be challenged, and only two of them were technology issues. And right. I think we can handle those, right? I mean, you know, well, some people are concerned about you know quantum attacks and. I think, you know, Addy, you were telling me that basically, yeah, we're working on that, and we're going to have it solved, and there's certain kinds of mathematical uh, uh, problems that aren't, that don't lend themselves to, to quantum attacks, and so we'll just replace what we have with that. Okay, but those business ones, the ones of culture, the ones of governance, um, you know, what, well, I'll kind of, kind of just go, go along the, the, the panel here. What's in our way? I mean, what has to be solved, whether it's a technology or a business issue or a regulatory issue, what needs to get knocked down before we're really going to get to the potential that's possible here? I mean, uh, from a healthcare perspective, the social one is, is believing that you have a responsibility to manage that data, and that's a social shift that will take time. In other words, is it really, am I willing to hold that as my responsibility? What if I spill my healthcare data? Who's going to clean it up? I mean, that kind of a learning, that that's a part of your job, is to be aware and manage that, that asset. That's, I think, a, a, a social one. From the privacy perspective, um, healthcare is quite complex uh, from a regulation perspective, but once you pull the data out of uh, the regulated framework and you own it yourself, um, you have a lot of freedom uh, to you know, share that information. And, and so from, from that perspective, it's very powerful to think about pulling that information out of existing privacy frameworks and manage it yourself. And there are, I think, fantastic opportunities there to do that uh, within the existing regulatory framework. Okay. Uh, I, I think that you know, one technological challenge or a series of technological challenges, one that this technology is very new and, and nascent. I, I know last year, uh, 2017, was, the, was a Hyperledger 1.0, which means the first release version of Hyperledger. So it is very new. That's one challenge. Uh, lots of folks are talking about scalability these days of these blockchains, and a lot of intelligent people working on these, more intelligent people than I am, are working on these problems. Uh, thirdly, I think you know one major organizational uh, barrier, a cultural barrier that you know I don't think is exclusive to healthcare. Um, you know, so we've talked about blockchains where they shine between you know multi-stakeholder environments, and the question often arises when you know folks come to us and are asking us about you know what's the promise of blockchain. Um, they say, you know, why should we share our data with our competitors or uh, our suppliers or our customers sort of thing, right? And then I think that's one of the, the, the biggest decisions that needs to be made is, you know, uh, which data can you share into this commons of data and, and you know, in, in what cases does it make economic sense to do so? And I think, uh, you know, where, where do we discover those sort of 
know, golden points where there's a, you know, economic sense and, and it is, it's feasible to share that data in a way that uh, the entire ecosystem benefits, uh, I think it's a matter of finding those. And it, it takes work, it takes work. Well, I think you're, you're, you're on one of the central points, and I know, Chris, this is kind of one of the points that, that you've been focused on, is that you know, an infrastructure that gives you a common version of the truth, where it really delivers a tremendous amount of value, is when you have lots of parties that are interacting with it. And it, it, you know, the point, Don, you were making, it quite transforms what, what supply chains are all about, uh, amongst other kinds of use cases. But, you know, this issue of how do you build consortia and how do you, you know, create the governance framework to, to make them work and incentivize everyone properly. Those are, you know, really big, challenging, you know, business and cultural issues. So do you, do you see anything on the horizon? You know, perhaps, Addy, do you see anything on the horizon that, that will help us kind of get over that or move to the level where that makes a whole bunch of sense? Time. Time. <laughs> Definitely helps. The analogy I usually make is the difference between internet and intranet. So when the internet came, a lot of the companies weren't uh, trusting it enough to hop on the internet and let's share um, our network with everyone else and our asset with everyone else. So they, but they had intranet, which is essentially the local version of the internet within the um, trust boundaries of a company. So blockchain, okay, companies have this, you know, we talked about a uh, culture shift uh, from the perspective of the consumer, but how about the perspective of the, the actual provider, the actual companies, the organizations who are providing these, uh, you know, services to consumers. Um, we see that uh, a lot of the um, uh, executives, a lot of the decision makers aren't feeling comfortable with blockchain and uh, I'll be, feeling the same if I was if I were them because as, as uh, Mark mentioned it's, it's really at its uh, infancy so um, what they can do instead to get us over that you know reluctance and fear of uh, the blockchain fear of the unknown fear of a, a new technology that hasn't really been ironed out is to have a private version of blockchain as a back-end technology within the compounds of their um, you know uh, company so they don't have to really share the stuff with another company but within their branches within their different departments within their company they have a lot of control and they can implement blockchain a private blockchain or maybe a consortium of blockchain if they have a friend uh, friendly company they can they can trust and then uh, then they can uh, first of all um, wet their feet so at least they get comfortable with they can uh, invest the assets that they have con control on and they had, and, and then um, uh, basically have uh, manpower, the people who can run and, and code and, and basically are familiar with this. Before we, you know, time passes and everybody is, is comfortable on actually going on the public or consortium, more, more, more public uh, consortium um, blockchains. So I, I think we need, instead of being futuristic and saying that we want to be this in 20 years, what do we want to be in five years? What do we want to be in, in 10 years? And the way I see it is the intranet of blockchain um, process, uh, history, if you will, is to basically uh, companies start with it as their backend technology within their compounds. And then um, everybody would slowly get more comfortable. And people in, and in the technology world are going to iron out more of the details. So uh, by the way, everybody is comfortable within their companies and we want to go broader. Those uh, issues have also been resolved. Chris, can I offer my uh, my perspective on the on the obstacles? Please. So um, this is like welcome to my world. I get these questions all the time, so I'm 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 well rehearsed. Uh, uh, first, the way the story goes is is I get this question all the time. If the first use case that proved that a blockchain was possible and useful, and that use case was Bitcoin, <clears throat> Bitcoin was launched in production ten years ago then why have there not been more production use cases in the financial services space than in the last, over the last 10 years? Uh, and the answer to that is, well, as, you know, being a, a, a long in the tooth technician, I, I, first, I first poked at the, at the technical obstacles and the, uh, the, the unsuitable nature of a, of a, permission, a permissionless blockchain. And that is, you know, the, the, the obvious things are scale. Um, you know, it processes to seven transactions a second. Well, that's not suitable in a financial services world where a Visa worldwide network is 50,000 transactions, 60,000 transactions a second. Um, the next thing is access. 
the permissionless blockchain is permissionless. It's open to everyone and, and, and anyone. The great unwashed can jump in, give it, some, give it some fiat currency, and be enabled with some Bitcoin. You don't have to tell them who you are. In fact, most people do operate under a pseudonym. They, they, they're some pretend name. Well, in the world of financial services where KYC regulations are, 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 need to be adhered to, that's a non-starter. So, you know, that won't work for us. Uh, the ledger is only updated every 10 minutes. Well, geez, when the financial services world moves fast. Moves fast. I mean, not every transaction takes five days to get something to India. Sometimes it's, it's in real time and 10 minute wait time is, is, is a problem. So, so we conclude that, that so there, there, those are some issues and they're being addressed. And, and again, in the 30 plus years I've been in this business, whenever a big formidable technical issue hits us, we say, you know, people panic. But at the end of the day, they prove to be the easy things to fix. Those will be fixed. There's an immense amount of money and the world's smartest people are being applied to these technical challenges. I have every confidence in the world those, those things will be solved. What I worry more about are the business issues. So I started thinking about this. I remember talking to you after a, after a conference, uh, and, and, and you helped me add two items to the list. Uh, you didn't know that, but you did. Um, <laughs> you get no royalty for that, by the way. Um, and, and so I started to populate this list, and I ended up with 14, 14 obstacles preventing a, aggressive adoption to blockchain of blockchain. Two of them are technical. 12 of them are business. Of the business issues, there's essentially six issues that are just generic change management issues, like fear of the unknown. And there are six issues that are very specifically uh, oriented to the, the, the unique characteristics of a shared ledger and, and, and blockchain technology. So in the, in the central uh, space, things like complexity, I, I agree. Today, the world of blockchain is far too complex. Somebody asks you a very simple question at a cocktail party and say, what is Bitcoin anyway? Well, it's really tough to answer that question because Bitcoin is at least three or four different things. And their mind starts to spin and they, you know, and they move on and say, well, how about those Blue Jays? <laughs> <coughs> the regulators, I mean, the, the regu just because you can doesn't mean the regulator is going to let you. So there's, there's some politicking and some, some exercising that needs to be done. Fear of the unknown is a, is a debilitating issue and that needs to be overcome. Uh, kind of an interesting story is in, in August, this past August, I spoke at the Chicago arm of the Fed. Uh, they invited me to come to speak because they, they, there was a, a conference of a, of a hundred or so uh, bank directors that were being educated and, and, and brought in to the Fed and they were talking about things like cybersecurity and blockchain technology and those kinds of things and they said, we want to hear about blockchain. We want to hear about distributed ledger technology, but don't bring us any consultants or fintech people who are looking to sell something. We want to hear from a practitioner. We want to hear from a bank. How does a bank, how does a major bank feel about this and what are they doing about it? Ask them to come and give us a perspective on this. I followed somebody that was recently retired from the Navy, 25 years with the Navy and the chief security officer at the Navy. And I said, holy cow, what am I doing on this platform? And I, so I'm intimidated. I'm looking out of the eyes. I said, well, how am I going to get past this? I'm shaking my boots. And finally, I said, I got, a, I got an idea. Just like Don did at the beginning of the meeting. I, let me, they, give me a show of hands out of 100 people. How many of you people know more about blockchain than maybe what you read on the airline magazine coming in to, to Chicago yesterday? And out of 100 people, only three names, uh, three hands went up in the sky. These are extremely senior people advising banks on the future, the future positioning and strategic nature of their business. Only three knew anything more than the hype that they read in an airline magazine. So we've got to get ourselves educated. We've got to get out of the ignorance and fear from not really understanding this. People need to just roll up their sleeves and invest the time to understand it. You can't consume this in 10 or 15 or 30 minutes. They need to sit down and understand what is this, how does it work, and then how does it, how does it disrupt your industry and the, and the way we manage data. And just a couple of samples of, of the unique characteristics on, on, uh, that are unique to blockchain, things like the network effect. These are, these are network applications, and I make the joke that there's, no, there's, there's nothing valuable being the only person in the world with a fax machine. But you got to have some meaningful adoption of the technology, some meaningful tipping point of adoption before the, the network application becomes useful and valuable to people. 
Is that 20% of the population, 60% of the population? It depends on the use case and, and, and it's subjective, but some number of people have to consume this. It's fine to have a great idea, but what is your strategy for achieving that tipping point of adoption necessary to make this a valuable endeavor? Sometimes people haven't even thought about it. They've just, they've just uh, you know, celebrate the technical implementation, have no idea how it's going to be adopted in the marketplace. Um, governance is an issue. The, the move to central bank digital currencies is an issue. Uh, shared IP in the, in the financial services world, we, we are light years behind some places like the medical industry and pharmaceuticals and, and industry shared IP. Uh, anecdotally, we had a use case that we were exercising last year. It was us and one other bank, two parties. We argued for three months about who owned the IP coming out of the first discovery meeting. Three months, legal teams you know, arguing back and forth. I mean, we have got to get over some of these issues because re-engineering commodity processes that nobody should feel particularly um, you know, wedded to, needs to, we got to drop our guard and go after these things hard and, and not argue about things like IP. The last thing is, is uh, the, the, the necessary cooperation of tradi traditional competitors. If we're going to, as financial services companies, jump in and say, okay, you know what, this, this, this cross-border transfer of, of money is an issue that's, that, that, that is deplorable and needs to be solved. It's a commodity process. Nobody's going to come and do business with TD Bank because I do that differently or I, I perform KYC checks better than RBC. I'm going to go and do business with TD. No, it's a commodity process. We just have to do it. And, and, and the sooner we, as, as, as traditional competitors, let our guard down and say, you know what, let's put the customer first and just conclude there's got to be a better way to do this commodity process enabled by blockchain, then we're going to move forward. Today, we come into a meeting, we'd argue for three hours about IP. So, so that's the nature of capitalism, and I think that the dramatic difference between uh, the internet and the, and the internet of information and how that came to be. It was academic community coming together and say, let's share intellectual capital and content and that kind of stuff and move forward. But when you take that same sharing and cooperative concept and put that into the capital world where people can make money and profit based on having a, a stranglehold on a, on a point of view, then, then old habits die hard. And, and that's what we have to bust through is some of the uh, cultural uh, obstacles to, to moving forward in the shared space. I couldn't agree more with you that we just have to get serious and educate ourselves on about what this is and what its potential is. I, I just add to that that you can also hire someone to help you with that. Mm -hmm. Or buy a book. Or um, buy a book. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Don, you, you, know, you yeah. talked about the the blockchain horseshoe and the potential of this local ecosystem to um, you know, really be the a world center of blockchain innovation. There are a bunch of obstacles, cultural, there's a skill obstacle uh, out there, I think, to some degree. But you know, what do you think we need to do as a broader ecosystem in this part of the world to assemble the constituent pieces to really make a substantive breakthrough in terms of, of you know, <clears throat> achieving the potential that's, that's available. Okay, well, first of all, why is it feasible to even think that Canada could be the center of the second era? Um, well, leaders of old paradigms have difficulty embracing the new, and Silicon Valley is not going to do it. Um, <laughs> largely because they viewed this whole thing as Bitcoin in an asset class they wanted to buy into Bitcoin. Um, what do we got in Canada? We got um, the biggest incubator in North America, probably the world, and some others, the DMZ 111 now. Um, we've got um, five banks, not 95. They can actually get together and rebuild the payment system. And they're at different levels, but they're all innovating, and they're all really working hard to figure this stuff out. Um, we, have, we used to have a brain drain now. Thank you, Donald Trump. We have a brain gain. And we used to have a company drain um, that had to do with funding. You'd maybe get some venture money, you build a little company, you get 10 million revenue, you want to raise another 20 million. 
Sequoia would say, sure, but you've got to move to Silicon Valley. Well, now, um, because of a whole bunch of things, one of them being ICOs, you don't have to be beholden to the US venture capitalists. Um, we have good universities. We have good computer science. We have governments that largely kind of get it. I mean, in our blockchain research institute, we have the Bank of Canada, the federal government, the Ontario government, the city of Toronto, and the UHM. We have vertical integration, if you like. And every one of those came from the, um, the most senior levels, including our prime minister, who's into blockchain. So um, that's good. Uh, we're the global center of thought leadership uh, with the Blockchain Research Institute. Uh, we got good talent. Canada's a great place uh, to live. Um, and overall, we've got a pretty uh, entrepreneurial culture that's going on. So people come up here from Silicon Valley and they see meetings. Um, and they, they're buzzing about the exciting stuff that's happening. So what do we need to do? to charge forward on that. Um, we need, uh, there are some things that could be done. I think, and we argue this in our, just Google, it's called Blockchain Corridor Report. Alex and I said, here's what we need to do to make this happen. Um, in the mining industry, Canada has the biggest R&D um, industry in extractive resources in the world. And that was achieved through a tax device called Flow Through Shares where an investor could get the tax benefit of a share up front. And um, it was, it's always been resisted in R&D, because it's one thing in mining, you know, somebody bought a drill. Well, that looks like R&D. Uh, but in mining, you know, it's, what's the money going to? T-shirts or, you know, bonuses for Silicon Valley VCs or whatever. What if... Um, CCRA and the Minister of Finance had some kind of distributed ledger where they could track every single penny real time that was being spent. So this is our proposal. Government of Canada should embrace blockchain and then move forward with a flow through uh, share uh, model in R&D and track it real time. And it won't be the Auditor General 14 months later saying, what was that? the Auditor General will say, what's going on over there? You know, in, in, in Mars right now, today, something looks funny. So that, that immediately, we estimate, would put $900 million into, the, um, into this economy a year. Uh, did I mention the Supercluster Fund? That's almost a billion dollars. It's going towards great R&D. Half of the top 10 have a big blockchain element to them. And there's another $300 million dollars uh, that's that's uh, coming. So um, we need to uh, make sure that our governments are model users of this technology. It's one of the most important things governments can do. And we need to have a good regulatory environment. Chris and others have, have spoken about this. Governments, from a regulation point of view, can really mess this up. And they're doing it in China, big time. I mean, we were thinking about competing with China. China, where Hangzhou province threw a billion dollars into a blockchain R&D center. You know, that, that kind of money. But China's shooting itself in the foot by restricting uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, by banning ICOs. Um, Korea's talking about doing the same thing. It would be a terrible mistake. It's one of the reasons I'm going there, is to do a bunch of media and to say, don't do this. And, you know, 100 years ago in Britain, they had uh, the government, in its wisdom, the regulators passed the red flag law. And the red flag law said that if you're going to be in one of these horses carriages, you need to have a driver, a navigator, and someone walking in front of your vehicle with a red flag so that the horses don't get scared. And this was, historians say, was a material factor in the hindering of the automobile industry in the UK. We can't do that here. Now, again, and, and uh, Chris and others were speaking to this, you know, we do need regulation. You know, the first era of the internet was about information. I was like, just government, keep your hands off it. Let it go. Net neutrality. Let it be free. Um, the second era, we're, we're not just talking about information, we're talking about assets where there is a public interest. Stuff like 
money and stocks and votes and our identities and so on. So we do need governments to, to be involved in a sensible way. But there are really dumb ways to do it, and there are sensible ways uh, to do it. You know, if, if you're doing a token sale, what does the token represent? Does it represent a share in a company? If so, that's a security. Looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. The securities legislators ought to, ought to be all over it. And you should either sell it to accredited investors, or you should go through a whole process of, you know, of, of complying with securities legislation. But most of these are not that. They're tokens that represent something else, a utility of some kind, you know, carbon credit, a future in some software that you're, you're going to build, a token that's monetizing a supply chain like uh, Sweetbridge, a currency of some, those are not securities and governments should stay away. And the SEC has been pretty good about this. And um, we need to, and, and the Ontario and uh, Canadian securities uh, people have been pretty good too. Uh, and we need to just keep going, pushing forward with that and getting clearer and more sensible regulation so that all of this stuff can kind of uh, flourish. I just wanted to say one more thing, which was the original question. By the way, those of you, young people, a fax machine is this thing. <laughs> and you put some paper into it, and it digitizes the paper. And it goes over wire, and some paper print. It's too hard to describe. Um, Are you saying I'm old? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should talk talk about fax machines after the uh, thing. That's a uh, that's over a glass of wine. Anyway, um, but you know, you asked me, Doug, like. What's it going to be? Like, uh, are the incumbents going to step up and do this, or are they going to be displaced? And I, you know, I don't really answer questions like, like, the future is not something to be predicted, something to be achieved. How is it shaping out so far? Banks are not pretty good in Canada so far. You've got UHN. They're not going to be displaced by some new, you know, uh, identity. <laughs> If anything, a new Canadian identity that collects all of our data and that we can manage responsibly might actually come from the UHN because they might be one of the first ones to implement it. And then the, then the, um, uh, the colleges and universities get involved and load on some you know, uh, post-secondary data that's attested to by the institution. And then maybe Ontario government would stick your driver's license there and the federal government might start to add stuff and we could all have a portable identity that we could manage responsibly and use this data to plan our lives and to monetize this data and to, and to protect our privacy. But I want, I want to tell you one uh, sort of humbling story. When I did the 20th anniversary edition of the digital economy, which was 1994, so I started working on this in, in um, 2014. And I, I had this thing in there about leaders of the old paradigm have great difficulties embracing the new. And I looked at all the jacket quotes. And there were a whole bunch of them, like about 20 of these gorgeous quotes from CEOs of major super innovative companies that said, this internet is the new thing, and Don has just nailed it with this book and everything. Half of those companies didn't exist 20 years later. And these are like big companies. So, you know, it's the innovator's dilemma problem, is that how do you find the will within you to do stuff like turn that damn remittance thing into a, a commodity? I mean, let's face it, you're not going to make a lot of money on that because it's just moving bits from one place to another. And socially, this is a trillion dollars a year that people are getting ripped off. And we could help these people build more vibrant economies around the world just by biting the bullet on that. Well, I don't know. Western Union sure not prepared to do that right now. They should. And they should find a way to reintermediate and create new values. So this is the great dilemma that we had with the whole first round of the internet, and it's playing out today as well. And that's why I keep saying leader, it comes down to leadership, finding the will to say, you know what, the old paradigm, limited, gone, it's going to be totally gone, let's be the leaders in embracing a new one. So Chris was skeptical at the outset that we were going to get through the 54 questions that I had prepared for this 
panel discussion. We've got through four of them so far. So, um, okay, let's uh, let's turn it quickly over to. Uh, Doug, I think given the time, we've got uh, half an hour left. As Don said, what, what better way to answer a question than with a beer in your hand? Fair enough. So we will uh, wrap this up. All of our panelists will be around um, until 8.30. So feel free to approach and ask any questions that you might have. Um, and on behalf of uh, the Bernie Group, I'd personally like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to especially thank all of our panelists. Um, it's been a really, um, uh, you know, entertaining but insightful discussion. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you.